It's time for the show that brings the magic right to your speakers. Ears up! Hey everybody, welcome to the show, Ears Up Podcast, and today we have a very special show for you. We are going to be going over the uh, the impact of uh, Mr. Ron Miller, who passed away recently, a couple weeks ago at this point right now. Um, he was, uh, well, I'll get into it later, but he was uh, at one point the CEO of, of the Walt Disney Company, and married to uh, Diane Disney Miller, so uh, he was Walt's, uh, what, son-in-law, right? Yeah, I believe so. Well, it was interesting, too, because we had just come from uh, the Walt Disney Family Museum. That's true. So, I, I don't know why that was interesting, <laughs> but... <laughs> Neither do I, it but I was letting you... It just a little closer to home, I, I guess. I was letting you just kind of play it out and see what happens. See what happens. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, see, it's, it's interesting, because... Uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. well, I guess it's really not interesting That's basically at all. how my brain works. Daily, <laughs> hourly, every minute uh, of every day, that's what happens. Man, I got to take off this uh, hoodie, this really nice uh, ears up fifth anniversary hoodie. Look at that. It looks oh so boy. good. Yeah, but Very nice. It's warm in here. Uh, we are uh, Terrence-less again. This is like the third or fourth show this year already so at what that point, he's missed. At what point... Is he a guest? Does he get fired? Oh, two years ago. <laughs> but he just won't leave. He's that's, he's our Floyd Norman. Oh, that's true. That's yeah. true. Yeah. Wow, that's kind of an honor. Yeah. And then uh, Bev is not here as well. That is true. So we're uh, it's just Taryn and I. I got my cat over in the corner here, and uh, that's it. We're just hanging out in the studio. Terrence will call in. Terrence had car problems. He was like 20 minutes away, and uh, he called me. He's like, dude, my car's overheating. I need to turn around and go home, which at that point would have been longer for him to go home than it would be just to come here and let the car cool down and then drive home later. But, uh, you know. But that's Terrence. Well, I didn't want to, and he didn't want it either, but I, I, neither of us wanted him to get stranded at our house. And then me have to like drive him home oh, or something that would have weird. Been way worse. Yeah, for sure. So that's happening with Terrence. And then uh, Bev's kid is sick. Abby's sick and has yeah. a stomach thing. And, uh, you know, like well, and that. it was nice of her and to she's not. She's not going to call in. <laughs> True. And that was also nice of her to not bring those germs to us. Yeah, I appreciate that. I already work in an office that's basically a petri dish. So, <laughs> is it a Petros dish? Um, maybe. No, it's not. I have a new microphone. Thank you to our Patreon people. We were able to upgrade Jason's microphone, and uh, hopefully it sounds better. I think it sounds pretty good. I'm still kind of, like, messing with it and, like, tweaking all the knobs out and, you know, making me uh, try to sound really nice, And uh, which is very hard. It's very hard to do that's for me to bad. sound good, but, you know, hey, man, that's what we do here. An <laughs> <laughs> this episode is sponsored by Get Away Today, Disney's top wholesale partner. They will help you plan your Disneyland vacation with the best tips and secrets, all while making it affordable with their discounted tickets, reduced hotel rates, and layaway plan. Head over to getawaytoday.com slash ears up and start planning your magical vacation. Tell them ears up sent you and use code ears up to save an extra 10 bucks on your SoCal vacation package. You can find us, of course, on social media. Maddie over there is doing a great job for us, as always, past, I think this is like her third week now. Yeah, it's awesome. And, uh, yeah, it's it's really nice to to have like good photos and, and timely updates for our listeners mm -hmm. as to what's happening. Right. <laughs> it's really good. Well, and from my perspective, because I was doing via Instagram, and I still am, I still dabble, right? But... Mm -hmm. There would definitely be weeks where I would be sitting at my desk and it would be like 4.30, we're recording at 7.30, and I realized yeah. I haven't posted anything in three weeks. And I'm like, and I have this like panic attack that like, not only does no one know what we're doing ever, but right. they don't know that we're recording tonight. And so I would always feel really bad. And so this is, it's really <laughs> great because we've, we've just got people talking and and I like it. And, and I'm still seeing everything, which is fun because I'm still involved. I'm still talking to people, yeah. but I don't have to always think about what to post and stuff like that. So it's actually really nice. I, I love them. Yeah, I like it too. It's, it's, it's great because she's just like, she's talking to people and answering questions. Like people are asking us questions, which I've always enjoyed about doing the show is people asking questions. And, and I think I've said before, just, I like to help people out. Right. And, um, do you secretly want to be interviewed? 
Do you want us to interview you? Yeah, I secretly for what? Like I don't know for for just who you are, your life. Your, oh. Do you want your life story? Oh, do out I there? want to be on this show? My life story is out there. <laughs> That's true. We've already talked about it, true. and also no one cares about that stupid stuff. <laughs> But uh, anyway, it's it is cool. It's interesting. I enjoy it. I enjoy the fact that uh, we don't have to really do a whole lot anymore, and um, that's good for me. It's great. I'm trying to get on our uh, on our stream, and I don't know. I just so I can pop in the chat room, but I don't think there's anybody in there right now, which is fine. Like I said, oh there it is right there. Like I said, man, we're uh, we're a podcast. If you wanna if you wanna watch us on YouTube and chat with other people watching, that's cool. Uh, usually we have some more people. I know. I'm surprised. Yeah, whatever. What are you going to do? Maybe I scheduled it wrong. <laughs> uh, Taryn, do we have... Oh, wait. I haven't even done my announcements yet. Hold oh, on a second. Boy. Hold on. I gotta, I'm got i doing so much stuff. i got to finish. Uh, send feedback on the show to Taryn at earsup-podcast.com. That's the segment we're about to do. Send show suggestions to Terrence at earsup-podcast.com. You can say hi to Bev. And anything else comes to me. I'm Jason at earsup-podcast.com. If you want to support the show, please head over to etsy.com slash cove ears you can browse our selection of great t-shirts and of course cove ears you get some cove ears on those uh mickey mouse hats please if you see a t-shirt that you like but you want it in a different style or a size or whatever uh message me through the store and i will add it that day and you can uh <clears throat> you can buy it from me that'd be great you can also support us via patreon go to patreon.com slash ears up you can support us for two bucks a month which is literally a dollar a show which, you know, look, we're honestly worth more than that. But, hey, <laughs> I understand things are tough. Uh, you know, taxes are coming. And uh, I don't want you to spend any more than, than, than you have to. So if you can make 2 bucks a month, that'd be cool. Um, if you can make 5 bucks a month, which is what I would really recommend, you get The Secret Show, which is we do a cocktail oh, yeah. and we do more news. But there's some swears. <clears throat> and it's stuff that we normally wouldn't talk about on this show. Also, double also. So if you're a Patreon uh, subscriber, of course, y you've, you've gotten a couple teasers of a new show that we're doing absolutely free to Patreon subscribers at the $5 level or more. Um, it's a, a, a bonus secret show. And in my, in my research for the uh, Ron Miller episode, I've stumbled upon... The, the the thing about the internet, there's a lot of like truths about the internet, right? But uh, the one truth that's pretty common, the the, the more you the, the deeper you dig into the internet, you will find a connection between whatever you're looking for, whatever subject matter you're searching for, uh, a connection between that and the Illuminati. <laughs> that's just it. There is some conspiracy theory about oh, I don't know um, ball bearings. And okay. the Illuminati. I, I, I bet. I don't know. There's some, some connection, right? But <laughs> apparently there's a, a, a big one about Walt Disney and the Disney company and movies that Walt has made and the Illuminati. Huh. Like, like a lot of content. Really? Yeah. So... You know, I, I've, I've been looking for ways to kind of give us uh, uh, just a bonus secret show, like every sure. once in a while, maybe a couple of months, maybe once a quarter. I don't know. We get together when we all have some free time and just do this other show. I don't know what you. Know, I didn't know what it was about, so I never really brought it up to anybody. Um, but this is, I, I think, this is our. This is gonna. Well, I'm not. I think this is going to be our show, and we're going to be recording it tonight after this show. Awesome. Which is a shame that it's only Taryn and I. I know. But it's it's still going to be good. Terrence is going to join, and we're going to talk about the Illuminati because if you've if you've heard this show before at all at length, or especially the secret shows, uh, Terrence's family started the Illuminati. <laughs> they actually came up with the name the Illuminati. That's how old they are. They're Jeez. old people. You know, I remember in our old house uh, when we were recording. I think we were on a break between the regular show and the secret show and the subject of the, the Illuminati came up and you and Terrence had, I, I don't want to say an argument, mm -hmm. but it was a very heated conversation about the Illuminati. Yeah. And so I... Because I think it's not real and Terrence believes otherwise. The exact opposite. He exactly. So. And so I'm actually very intrigued <laughs> by this and I and I am a little sad that Terrence isn't here in person for uh, it, but... Yeah. It'll be all right. It'll be good, man. So uh, anyway, that show is called, um, <laughs> it's called The Pyramid, The Eye, The Ears. 
and I cut together a whole new intro for it. It's a whole thing. It's a separate show, but we're just putting it up on the secret show. It's something fun that we're going to be doing. Uh, and uh, anyway, tonight we're going to be talking about, uh, I don't want to give too much away. We're going to be talking about Fantasia and how Walt made that on the behest of the Illuminati. That's all I'm oh, going to say. Okay. That's, all That's I'm a say. teaser. Yeah. But we will have t-shirts. We have a logo made already, <clears throat> kind of cleaning up a little bit. Um, and I'm going to put it on the Etsy site. I'll let you know when it's up. I don't know when it'll be up. Maybe next week, maybe two weeks. Who knows? But uh, it's going to be pretty good. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited about it. I can't wait to wear my own shirt, which is weird. <laughs> I feel like I'm in the band and I'm wearing my own shirts. Well, you're wearing your own shirt. You were wearing your own sweatshirt. Now you're planning <laughs> on buying your other own yeah. shirt. I mean, uh, get a new wardrobe. Uh, I know. I can't. It's so good. <laughs> I only wear good uh, articles of clothing. But anyway, <clears throat> so patreon.com slash ears up. And if you subscribe, if you're hearing this two months from now, four months from now, a year from now, if we're still even around, you can just subscribe now and you can get, you get all the shows. You can go back and you can listen to each show. So don't worry about it. You haven't missed anything. You can still yeah, that's, go back that's and check the loophole. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, and spread the word obviously too. That's really going to help us out a lot. Uh, also, you know, so I know I've mentioned ab about uh, rating us on iTunes and how that helps somehow. And I don't really know, but it kind of does. Uh, apparently now that's not true. Apparently just listening to us on Google play is like the way to go. Right. Because Google owns the internet. And so anything that you do on Google, they're going to wait heavier. So, which is really unfair as just a concept, but also because you can't, because Google Play doesn't have podcasts. No, they do. They uh, we're do? on Google Play, yeah. Oh, I couldn't find it on my phone, and somebody else had the same problem, and so hmm. it was weird. And so, like, you have to listen to it on your computer, and I don't know. So, uh, no, I'll you don't have to, have to listen on a computer. Yeah, it's. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I can listen to it. I can pull up on my phone uh, right now, as a matter of fact. Oh, crazy. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm wrong. Yeah, oh, that's well. all right. Hey, man, it happens. Don't you have to be it. wrong like once a year. So that's that was, true. That was my one time. <laughs> that's true. We are uh, doing a lot, you know, to try to get listeners and, and push our numbers up. We're already number one on the, on the first page of Google for Disneyland podcast. We're not number one, but we're up there. So anyway, if you listen to the show, you know, hey man, if you wouldn't mind throwing us a listen on the Google Play on the podcast app, which is maybe why you had a problem downloading. Anyway, mm. that'd be cool. Spotify, we're also on Spotify. Ultimately, just do whatever you're comfortable with. If you're uh, in to any kind of internet shopping, if you use the internet for anything other than researching Illuminati, <laughs> conspiracy <laughs> theories. Which I don't know why you would, but... Uh, you can, well, you know what? You can get a bunch of books through our Amazon link that's on the homepage for the Illuminati. And, uh, you know, 20% ev of everything that we get from Amazon goes back to the Illuminati. So we are <laughs> uh, a front for that. Uh, Patreon update real fast. You do uh, get a newsletter, like I mentioned in the last show, and I, I apologize. Brittany is doing our newsletter. It will be bi-monthly instead of, uh, I think she is wanted to do one weeks? like, yeah, she wanted to do one like every week. And oh, I, like, I owe I her some stuff. Probably. Yeah. So, bi-monthly for your Patreon folks. Don't worry about it. Cool. I think we got Terrence on the line. Are you there, buddy? Cool. Nope. Hold on a second. <clears throat> I haven't stopped the music yet. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Never stop the music. Ba -da -da -da. Hey, what's up, buddy? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Hello. Oh, Hello, Terrence. How are you? I'm well. How about yourself? I'm pretty good. You kind of sound pretty good. You're, yeah. You sound like you're right here. Oh, good. Yeah. That's probably... <laughs> Probably a lot better than me being right there as well. <laughs> well, I don't know, man. We had to eat your loaded baked potato that we Dude, bought you for dinner. I, okay, so I was, was really... <laughs> it was pretty good. It was. And I when you said that that's what you wanted and I ordered it, I was like, God, who would order that? Like, geez. It's cat out. It's like Ugh. a gut buster. Yeah. And then it got here and we were like, oh, well, I guess that's ours now. And oh my <sighs> God, that thing is good. It's, it's a amazing. cheesy potato with meat on it. Yeah, it's pretty so good. So it's, it's kind of cool because you they have it uh, as a... Bake a pulled pork baked potato, but you can get it with whatever meat they have there. So I've had it with like um, ball tip on it, stuff like that. Super yeah. good. Nice. nice. All right. And not not keto at all. <laughs> no, really. <laughs> no. Nah. Well, whatever. Anyway, shouts out to Kinders, their little barbecue place. The Twenty First Amendment. Speaking of shout outs, has been serving craft beer in the San Francisco Bay Area for nineteen years, from their initial brew pub on Second Street, which is just two blocks from Giant Stadium in San Francisco to their production brewery and tap room across the bay in San Leandro, the 21st Amendment is now located in 29, excuse me, available 
in 29 <laughs> states, including in and around the parks. Next time you're in San Francisco, visit the Brew Pub and their new tap room in San Leandro for some great beers and good food. And be sure to ask for the 21st Amendment wherever you can find good craft beer. All right, Taryn, let's do some feedback a little bit, please. You got it. Let me just pull this up. Apologies. Terrence, I'm disappointed you're not here, man, because uh, you were you you are next in line for my microphone. So, but now Taryn is using it. Yeah. So uh, I well, was I was looking I'll take forward it back to in it. a couple weeks. Okay. All right. Our first feedback is from Parker. Hi, Bev. Hi. <laughs> I don't know why she sounds like that. <laughs> or hello. Uh, I'm not sure what she's hello. I'm not sure what she's doing nowadays. My name <laughs> is Beverly. <laughs> Anyway, one of our friends just went to the park for Disneyland and he got a button and they wrote on it. Not sure if it was due to complaints <laughs> or if Terrence just had bad luck. Uh, I believe that Terrence had bad luck and it was complaints. Like it was probably two things. <laughs> oh, there's no way they just rolled out a cart on a r- random day. You know, that's what they <laughs> were doing. Maybe somebody it was got like word of me. extra busy or something that day. <laughs> yeah, or maybe they, they didn't have time to stock it, but I feel like, uh, I don't know. Maybe they were just like stocking the podium and you just like went into their inventory. They had a terrible CM. <laughs> That'd be kind of That'd cool. be hilarious. You stole. Yeah, I would. Uh, moving on. Non-Disney related. How have you and Jason not heard of The Greatest Showman? My first thought oh, yeah. was, have know. you been living under a rock? Yeah. And then I remembered Alice. Makes total sense. <laughs> uh, well, Disney f- Petros means rock. So that is true. Yes, I have been. <laughs> Greek rock. Yeah. Uh, your Disney friends, Parker and Christine. Well, yeah. The weirdest part is that I, yeah, I hadn't even heard of it. Yeah, I still we, kind of don't. We also don't really get out much. It's it, a but movie, this is before right? No, it's a it's a board game. That you oh play with God. other people on Skype. It's weird. It's a whole Shut thing. Up. You get on I, Discord and you just go, I want to chat. When you don't know what something is and then you, you joke like that, I have yeah. no reason to not believe you. No, I'm serious. It's a board game. <laughs> it's not a board game. It's not a board it's game. It's a movie. Or My a name TV is show. Darren. I am a <laughs> robot. The greatest showman. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much for reading feedback, Darren. Uh-huh. <clears throat> And uh, Terrence, Bev was supposed to do a window tonight, but and she sent it to you. I guess you're going to be Bev tonight? Oh, she sent it to me, and you know how nonsensical Bev is when she <laughs> talks? Oh, this Try is great. Try to read a window thing. <laughs> you don't have to do it. I, 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 didn't, uh, I didn't really announce it until just right now. So if, if, <laughs> if you want to run it through the translator, uh, you know, we, can, we can just make her do it later. I'm going to do it real quick. You ready? Yep. There is a window on Main Street. This guy did stuff, and I like what he did. There's one time where he said something really neat, and that was neat. <laughs> that was the window. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Is that really what she wrote? Bro, it's – it's. I, she won't listen to this. Yeah, it was ridiculous. <laughs> it was absolutely ridiculous. Oh, man. <gasps> Poor Bev. Uh, fired. <laughs> fired. <laughs> Bev or Terrence? <laughs> Both. I don't know why. All oh, right. Man. So we'll just make Bev do the window. Sounds good. Okay. <laughs> I'm all right with that, man. I'm okay with that. Make her do something for a change. Oh, I got a sick kid. And then she goes, even if I wasn't sick, I wouldn't show up. Really? Bro, she really said that? Yeah. Well, but she, I mean, I'm being facetious. She said, like, I wouldn't expose you to the germs. Oh. Which okay. I appreciate. Yeah, me too. Hey, by the way, <clears throat> real fast, we're, we're I'm sort of talking to Jeremy about planning our uh, Christmas show, just so you guys know. Yes. Wow. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I think he, I think he's gonna come out like a couple of weeks before December, and we're gonna do like a thing. I don't know what it is, but we're gonna do like a whole. I like show. it. Yeah. I'm so down. just so Can you, know you make happening. sure that he comes for like more than twenty four hours this yes. time. Yeah, I'm gonna try for <laughs> sure. I mean, there's so much to see out in San Francisco, which is like eight hours away. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but yeah, we'll, we'll definitely be taking them around and, and, and do some stuff. And I think what we'll do is, is time it for our Christmas party. Mm-hmm. So, okay. you know, he has no choice. Well, he promised me he was coming to our Christmas party this year. Yeah. So, so just so you know, Terrence word, just to let you know. All right. Let's talk about, uh, Ron Miller. Huh? You guys want to do that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. The, the, the more we kind of like, look, to be honest, the, the, the fewer numbers of topics that we have we start getting into 
people in the Disney company and what they've done and whatever, which I always thought was like, really, who cares? I, I, I don't know. I just, I think it's kind of weird, but in looking into Ron's life, there's, he did so much that you, you have no idea about. And even the people that are mentioned in this have done tons to make Disney, not only what it is, but uh, to guide it out of really terrible times. Mm-hmm. So I, I think moving forward, contrary to what I had thought earlier, we're going to be talking about more people than just Walt and, you know, some of the people that we kind of know, uh, inherently anyways, which I'm really excited about. Yeah. So, uh, Ron Miller was born on April 17th, 1933, and he passed away February 9th, 2019. Uh, he was an American businessman and professional American football player. Obviously that is directly from Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but more notably, he was president and CEO of the Walt Disney Company from 1978 to 1984. So he was president for longer than he was CEO. And we'll get over that in a second. I think he was CEO for like 18 months or something like that. It was a, an insane uh, short amount of time. Uh, Do but you know what the difference between those two things are at no. the Disney Company? Chief executive oh. officer and president. I'm sure there's hmm. president I was just reports to the CEO. Okay. Who's bo- uh, some board? I don't know. They have a board. Cool. Um, and he was president of the board of directors of the Walt Disney Family Museum, of course, because he was the son-in-law of Walt Disney, which means he was married to Diane Disney, who started the Walt Disney Family Museum. And I'm still trying to get them for an interview. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I really, uh, but of course, it, we were talking about dates when Ron passed away. So I'm not going to sit here and push you for an interview, you know, when you guys are, right. are dealing with all... Oh, what's happening, Terrence? Am I gone? No, you're not gone, but you just kind of shifted. Oh, sorry. Tone. That's all right. It just sounded a little weird. That's all. Uh, Ron, of course, uh, like I said before, was a, a football player, and he was playing high school ball, which every professional plays high school ball. Uh, apparently, Ron's coach directed his life very unknowingly. Ron says, I have a lot of quotes from Ron in this because he's given a lot of interviews over the years, and, and uh, he seems like a really just ni- nice, down-to-earth kind of straight shooter. He goes, uh, I had a wonderful coach, Harry Ellison, who saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. Harry was part of a recruiting team and asked me one day where I wanted to go to college. I said, USC. So as I'm standing in front of him, he called a recruiter at USC and says, I've got a kid here that you've met on a recruiting trip and he wants to go to your school. Ron Miller. Ron. Miller. M I L L E R. And he carried on a conversation for a while and said, Look, I want you to give him a scholarship. Uh, you don't have any more scholarships left? Oh, uh, well, that's, that's too bad. So he talked a few more minutes and said, Look, let's cut out all this crap. Ron Miller wants to go to SC, and if you're not going to give him a scholarship in five minutes, I'm going to make a call to UCLA. He's going to go to UCLA, and someday he's going to beat your ass. Nice. <laughs> and that was it. They gave me a scholarship to SC. Nice. I mean, that's That's pre- how deep that. <laughs> <laughs> the Illuminati. The bloodlines, the Illuminati. <laughs> so anyway, so Ron ends up, of course, going to uh, USC, and it's where he met his future wife, Diane. Oh. And they so they met in college on a blind date, apparently. And this is another quote from Ron. Uh, I pulled up from an interview he gave. He says, I played left end, and my best friend played right end for the Trojans. He had a girlfriend who lived off campus. His girlfriend's roommate was Diane. So they put their two minds together and said, after the game at Berkeley, why don't we get a blind date arranged? So I bought off on it. We played the game, and I had a pretty good game, but I was tired. Afterwards, we went to some dive. I took a shot of bourbon thinking I'm going to get in a mood. <laughs> oh, gee. <laughs> yeah, there right. <laughs> I know. Hey, yo, which is like 50s talk for uh, I might, you know, see an ankle. Right. <laughs> uh, nothing happened. And I was about to go to sleep. I looked over at Diane and Diane was looking at her friend and she was going like this when she makes the square sign. Oh. You know, like in Pulp mm. Fiction. Yeah. Right. Where square. they. Yeah. The L7. Right. L7 uh, weenie, yeah. yeah uh, where she was going like this. And I saw it. So I thought, I got to get out of here. So he saw Diane basically telling her friend that he was a square. She wasn't into it. That's hilarious. I said I was going to go to the bathroom, and I never came back. I went to the hotel, jumped in bed, and went right to sleep. (laughs) The next morning, we all went back to L.A. on the train, and there was Diane. I went up and apologized. She accepted the apology. We drank beer on the train. Our first date was October 6th of 1953. 
Ron and Dan were then married in Santa Barbara on May 9th, 1954. So not even a year later. Wow. So he, so after Walt, after a blind date that went terribly. Yeah. Turns out, you know. Well, and also my first thought is like Walt not only was building Disneyland, but he had to have his daughter's wedding. Yeah. That's all the lot. date of my daughter's <laughs> wedding. <laughs> on this, the day of my daughter. Uh, of course, something else was going on in the summer of 1954, Taryn, in oh. a bunch of orange, gro- orange groves in Anaheim. Disneyland was under construction. So, of course, Miller initially worked at Walt Disney Productions for a few months in 1954, chauffeuring ar- architectural plans between Disney offices in Burbank and the construction site in Anaheim while he was waiting to be drafted into the military. No, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah but back then, man, you couldn't say no. There's no yeah, way. No. You're like, ah, yes, please. Yes, and yeah. when is this happening? Okay, so he needed a job. What's he going to do? Ask uh, ask his father-in-law for a job. So he was employee number six oh. of the original Disneyland team, wow. he says uh, of his experience. And so twice a day, I would drive from Burbank to Anaheim and drop off the plants. I saw them move the orange trees. I saw them develop rivers of America without water. I was watching something really exciting happen. Jeez. When he returned from the military, he signed on with the L.A. Rams. So he went back to playing Football, which I don't know how you can, first of all, imagine going from seeing Disneyland being built, then you're in the military when it opened, and you hear people talk about it, and you're like, ah, it's my, you know, whatever, right? That's crazy. Uh, and football being a contact sport, of course, much more so back then than it is now. You know, you can't sneeze on people these days. Uh, <laughs> but back then, uh, you know, they had like, yeah, whatever. Uh, he happened to get knocked out during a game, a game that Walt just happened to be at. He says, my father-in-law saw me play in two football games when I was with the L.A. Rams. In one of them, I caught a pass, and Dick, night train lane, let me have it from the rear. That's his quote. I didn't make that up. (laughs) That's what he said. His forearm came across my nose and knocked me unconscious. Wow. I woke up in about the third quarter. (laughs) So Walt is sitting in the stands and saw this happen saw his son-in-law get knocked out and pulled off the field jeez uh and at this point he had two kids so they already had two kids by this time right Mm -hmm. uh at the end of the season walt came up to me and said you know i don't want to be the father to your children (laughs) you're gonna die out there how about coming to work with me i did and it was a wise decision on my part So Walt sponsored his son-in-law and got him into the Screen Directors Guild, which is much safer, I think, than than the the gridiron. But Uh, also, can we just talk for a second about how weird it is that this guy was a professional football player? (laughs) Like, I did not see that coming For like a season, I think, is what it was, yeah. That's insane. I know, right? Wow. I mean, and you look at photos of him, he's a a big, he's a tall, wide dude. Yeah, he he looked like a football player. That's absolutely correct. What was his position, did you say? Uh, Left end, which I don't don't know what that means. means. Sports ball. (laughs) Sports ball. I know quarterback and coach. That's about it. Yeah. Uh, And Miller worked as a uh, second assistant on Old Yeller in 1957. So that was his first job, which then led him to move into a variety of producer positions and also directing some of Disney lead-ins for the popular weekly Disney television series. Mm. Uh, I'd always been shy, Ron said, and when I first started becoming involved in creative meetings, I laid back. I had good thoughts, but I let somebody else eventually come up with the idea, which is a great quote, by the way. Because he's basically admitting, like, I had all the good, I- not all, the- I had a good idea before, but I knew someone else would have it, yeah, so I so just I kind s- of, like... gave it to them. Yeah, like, I let them have it. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty good. Um, he says, uh, but Walt wasn't afraid to throw out any idea. He threw out everything. I realized you can't prove to others you've gotten a certain talent unless you let them know you've got a talent. Which is, that's how I work. Like, whenever we're trying to do something creatively, you just throw something, you, you just go. Because it might be dumb. Might be a bad idea, but number one, if nobody knows about it, y- you don't you don't know you don't know if it's gonna be a bad idea because I think I have too many bad ideas, right? But you don't also know how that idea is gonna spark something in someone else. Totally. Mm-hmm. So you could throw out an idea for something weird, and someone else will go, you know what? That's great, but we could also do this with it, and then it comes into something really cool that would never have happened had you not had said your your job. So don't well, hide. That happens everybody. all the time. That's one of the best things about brainstorming meetings. You're supposed to write stuff on post-its and put it up on a wall, and then you start connecting them. 
Yeah. It happens all the time. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty good. Um, let me see. Let's skip to here. This is okay. I I, I there's a couple points in this where I I thought I might cry. This might be one of them. <clears throat> oh wow. So uh. He's working in Hollywood, right, doing a bunch of stuff. Uh, Shortly before Walt's death in December of 1966, Ron and Diane, along with Walt's wife, visited him in the hospital. I want you to meet my son, Walt said to the nurse. But she corrected him. You mean son-in-law? No, my son, Walt said resoutly. Uh, Ron said, it's the greatest thing that's ever been said to me. Oh, that's really nice. Like I'm legitimately choking back tears right now. Like I almost (laughs) lost it on the know my son part. Oh. Like honestly. That's really nice. Isn't it? it, I mean, it's adorable. Yeah. And it shows you really how much Walt meant to Ron Mm -hmm. and how much being included in his family meant and what Ron meant to Walt. Yeah. Yeah. Because I feel like Walt wouldn't go that far. You know what I mean? He doesn't seem like that kind of person. Right. He seems a little like stand off, like. Love, loving guy because you know he created the happiest place on earth yeah. but he also seems a little bit like distant I well think. like to 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 let you into his family and also maybe it was you know it was the 60s and maybe it was a little bit more of like well it's my son-in-law whatever but also can we talk about how dumb this nurse is you're gonna first of all i know rude. you're gonna Bro. walt is in the hospital <laughs> not doing well right. right and you're gonna correct this dude he could say oh this is the moon this is the, pl- the <laughs> our actual satellite. The moon is coming in to meet the moon, and you go, "Oh hi, moon! I I loved you in, um, <laughs> you know, Moon over Miami or whatever." <laughs> right. Terrible. Anyway, uh, Miller was credited as producer on a bunch of films, a bunch of stuff, uh, and I have a list right here. Some of it good, some of it not really so good. <laughs> so we're gonna go through. I just want to read some highlights, and he's. A ton of stuff, right? Uh, the Zorro TV series, uh, Son of Flubber. Oh, jeez. Okay. That's a winner. <laughs> right. Well, and this is this kind of like phases into the next chapter in Ron's life and the next chapter of Disney, to be honest. Uh, something called A Tiger Walks. Don't know. The Misadventures of Merlin Jones. Never heard of it. That Darn Cat. Heard of it. Oh, jeez. <clears throat> uh, Monkeys Go Home which I kind of want to watch now. It was 1967. <laughs> uh, never a Dull Moment, Guns in the Heather. Okay. Sorry, what? Exactly. Uh, Secrets of the Pirates Inn, that's a TV movie. Menace on the Mountain, The Boat Nicks, Crystal, Crystal Bal- Balito, The Calypso Cult. Okay. Yeah, right, exactly. Of course, the grand opening of Walt Disney World, The Strange Monster of Strawberry Cove. Now, these are TV uh, TV movies right here. Um, Snowball Express was a movie. Never heard of it. Uh, <laughs> the Wiz Kid and the Mystery at Riverton. That's a TV movie. The Castaway Cowboy is like an actual like movie movie. Uh, Escape to Witch Mountain, which they kind of, yeah. I think, just remade a little bit ago, but he was EP yeah. on that. Um, no deposit, no return. <laughs> what a name, dude. These are all horrible. And this is uh, late 70s, 1976. Uh, Treasure of Mate Kumbe. Uh, then the Shaggy DA. Heard about that, of course. Freaky Friday. They've read that a couple of times. Mm-hmm. That was a big one. The Rescuers. Herbie oh. Goes to Monte Carlo. The new Mickey Mouse Club series. So he was kind of on a roll now. Born to Run. Pete's Dragon. Uh, then Candle Shoe, which Candle <laughs> Shoe. I kind of want to watch ran, it. <laughs> they ran out of I feel, ideas. At I feel that like point. they created the first like naming uh, artificial intelligence, <laughs> <laughs> or, yeah. or maybe they're like coming up with titles like like Bowie used to come up with some songs. Just put a bunch of words in a hat and pull them out in <laughs> yeah. sequence, and that's me writing. Uh, Return from Witch Mountain, a Cat from Outer Space, Christmas at Walt Disney World, uh, the Apple Dumpling Gang rides again, the Black Hole. On and on and on. Tron, The Black Cauldron, Never Cry Wolf, The Devil and Max Devlin. Anyway, he's producing a lot of stuff. Uh, Miller became president of Walt Disney Productions in 1978. And now, uh, like I said, it's a great time to talk about where the company was film-wise at that time. I read you that list. That was from the 60s on. They didn't really do 
so well. Their live action movies really weren't doing so well. In late 1979, Disney Productions released The Black Hole, a science fiction movie that was the studio's first production to receive a PG rating. Oh. Ron felt it was his mission to reinvigorate its film division, where, of course, obviously, at the list I just read you, he had spent most of his career as a producer and executive. Live action movies like Herbie Goes Bananas and The Last Flight of Noah's Ark weren't really doing all that well. Weird. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> but you know we're going to watch some of these. And, and, and once we finish our classics reviews, we're going into... Uh, Disney made-for-TV movies. Oh, jeez. Well, we've got <laughs> plenty of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and the studio's new animated films were not as memorable as its classics, like Snow White, Pinocchio, stuff like that. They really hadn't been hitting that mark uh, for a while. In order for Disney to advance and be taken seriously in Hollywood again, Ron felt they had to break free, uh, excuse me, break away from the family-oriented movies and get into the greasy world of PG rated movies. Whoa. Now remember, PG in the 80s, in the 70s, was not PG now. PG in the 80s, I think you could still have a couple swears and some nudity, and that's PG because it's just parental guidance suggested. Did they even have like R back then? Yeah, they yes. had like, Ooh, yeah, but they I think but it was like really bad. I think it was only like three three ratings when it came out maybe four oddly enough i read in doing research for this uh spielberg was the one who pitched the idea of a pg-13 oh interesting like the middle ground mm -hmm. that's cool yeah so you know and obviously disney lives in the g world yes and they needed to move up and ron knew they kind of needed to move out of g and into pg to to combat cool. and, and to just to to get a foothold in Hollywood to compete with all the other movies because things were kind of getting a little bit racier in the 70s and 80s. You well, know, you have Hollywood. to be edgy. I mean, even I think anything that's, that's cool is edgy in right. some respect. And that's so why I'm super cool. Right. <laughs> uh, we've got trouble, Mr. Miller told the Los Angeles Times a few months after his appointment, and we're doing something about it. So, again, this was the late 70s uh, when, you know, this kind of started happening. A time when sci-fi movies were going strong thanks to a little film I like to call Star Wars, mm -hmm. which uh, I think further influenced Disney to really shift towards less animation and a broader scope of darker live-action movies. So, again, in doing research for this, I found a couple quotes. Check this out. Lucas was shopping his script around in to Hollywood to everybody. 20th Century Fox, Universal, but what he really wanted to do was make this movie at Disney. Hmm. Here's a quote from Lucas. This is a Disney movie. All Disney movies make $16 million. <laughs> so this movie is going to make $16 million. It cost $10 million, so we're going to lose money on the release, but I hope to make some of it back on the toys. Wow. Oh my gosh. So <clears throat> a couple things to unpack there. Mainly, yeah. they had the opportunity way back then to get their hands on the Star Wars franchise, and they passed on it. It was wow. rejected at Disney. Now they can't stop bringing that towel it's out. Seriously. Uh, but also, Lucas, man, what a genius. I know. Yes. What a genius. And he knew, like, he yeah. held on to the toy rights. That was a thing. Yeah, I remember we saw that on a TV show mm -hmm. about Star Wars toys. But mm -hmm. yeah, like that was it was almost it's almost actually congruent to what Disney did where eventually he learned it took him a while, but that he he had to sell all of this Mickey Mouse stuff and he to had pay to for stuff, have yeah. all the rights to that to to counter the lose the losses of other things like Absolutely. So. And, I mean and, and it's that merchandising that saved Disney. Yeah. Um, That's the term. Right. I could not come up with it. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Uh, at any rate, in 1978, Disney started working on their version of Star Wars, the aforementioned The Black Hole. They were gunning for a PG rating, and word got out that this was the case, that they were shifting their priorities to focus on getting PG. Not everybody was happy with Disney's newfound edge, however, and uh, Miller admitted that he'd received letters from people. Which, I don't know what a letter is, but <laughs> we'll get into that later. Like an email, I guess? It's like a printed out email. Oh, yeah. Those are cool. I like those. Uh, who were concerned that the black hole would be some kind of expletive-laden stain on Walt Disney's memory, which is a quote I lifted from <laughs> somewhere. Uh, we've gotten a lot of letters, and we're going to get a lot more, Miller confided. I got one from a woman doctor, and a couple of days later, her husband or son saying that they hope the picture flops. 
Oh, wow. Dang, dude. <laughs> it's a family affair. <laughs> <laughs> but I can imagine like her writing in and then just yelling at her husband and son to like write in also. Have you sent your letters yet? I don't know <laughs> yeah. why. Uh, but again, back then PG was racier than it is now. So here, here are the PG movies around this time, late 70s, early 80s, right? Okay. Gremlins. Oh, wow. wow. Think, okay. of, th- think about Gremlins, no, how kind of scary. scary it is. There's gore. Uh-huh. The Gremlin explodes in the microwave. It's true. Right? <laughs> PG. Raiders of the Lost Ark. PG. Yeah, I can see that. Sexual see overtones, that violence, yeah. people dying on the screen, face melting, ghosts, yep. uh, the occult, yeah. Yeah. Nazis. PG. Meatballs. I, I don't know what that is. Bro, that's way that's, past PEG. I know. <laughs> it's it's uh, Watch Meatballs. It's like a cult classic. Anyway, it's Disney, definitely not normal Disney fare, but Ron knew this was the direction they had to go in. <clears throat> Over the next few years, Disney tried out more PG films, such as the 1981 film Condor Man. Huh? Sounds cool. Right. With Disney's 1982 slate of PG-rated films, including the horror mystery The Watcher in the Woods, the thriller drama Night Crossing, and the science fiction film Tron. So between those three movies, or no, between, sorry, the 1982 PG movies, uh, the company lost over $27 million. Yikes. <laughs> so Tron did not do well at first? or No, no. Tron, oh. Tron is a cult. Classic. It oh, did I didn't not do that. well. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. Big time. <clears throat> uh, Tron was considered a potential Star Wars level success film by the film division. So things weren't really looking great for Disney and for Ron, to be honest, and PG movies in general. But regardless, Ron was busy taking Disney films in a new direction. So he was confident True. that they had to, to go there. He knew that they, that they were going to have missteps and mistakes, but that's where they needed to be. It's a good thing he was married into this family because he. Uh, it sounds like had a part in a lot of really bad movies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I feel like maybe anyone else would have just been fired. <laughs> <coughs> possibly. Yeah. That's possibly true. Uh, he funded two groundbreaking and very influential shorts by a young Disney animator called Tim Burton. Never oh, heard of him. Wow. Who's that dude? Uh, Vincent and Frankenweenie. Oh. I like Frankenweenie. And the so Frankenweenie was super dark and it was never really here's here's a uh, here's a quote from from Tim Burton at the uh, at the premiere of Frank and Winnie the the movie, so Disney funded the short. Nobody saw it because it was considered too dark. And then Burton made it into a full length movie. And then this is him talking about it at the release of that. Okay. He says Frank and Winnie means a lot to me. The thing about it is. The first time around in the early 80s, it came at a strange moment in Disney's history. They didn't know what they were doing really at the time. There was a whole group of really talented people not being allowed to do very much. It was a bit Shakespearean as those older guys from Snow White days were clinging on to power. I wasn't a very good animator, at least not in their tradition, so I had the opportunity to be left on my own for a year or two in a room and just draw. And that's Ron. Ron gave him the money to do that. A greenlit those projects and considering what tim burton has done not only for disney but just for film and just entertainment in general. in general had that not happened had ron not greenlit those projects i wonder if it, we even crushed him i Who wonder knows? if johnny depp would even be popular <clears throat> oh yeah crybaby yeah mm. he may not be as popular today but johnny depp was but i feel i feel like edward scissorhands put him in a different category of sure. like a, a different type of actor <laughs> i was i was reading uh actually in the same story this quote from they were talking about when johnny depp first met uh tim burton to talk about edward scissorhands and to go over it johnny depp's first impression was get some sleep dude <laughs> Because oh, Tim Burton's just lanky and pale and gaunt and this wild hair, and I guess <laughs> doesn't really complete sentences very oh. well, uh, and he just kind of yeah, it's like a thing. <laughs> Did I make it probably. up that he is You're probably married to um, H- Helen Baum Carter? Yeah, no, that he he oh, he was not anymore. I think they divorced it because they're like no, they the were, same they were person. Never married. They were just uh, together. Uh, oh, okay, living in sin. That's crazy. They're they're <laughs> like up. they're like looking in a mirror. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, yeah. Anyway, no, no, that's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, what, uh, another thing influential that Ron did was acquire the rights to Gary K. Wolf's 1981 mystery novel, Who Censored Roger Rabbit? Oh. Later becoming Who Framed Roger Rabbit in 1988. Huh. 
Right? Didn't know. But he <laughs> saw potential in that for a Disney movie, and he and he approved wow. the rights for it. Man, he was right mm-hmm. about it. He really yeah. was, right? Yeah. While all this was happening, Ron, who was named CEO in 1983, by the way, ushered in the Disney Channel. Oh. Which had been proposed way back in 1977, and but not by him. Uh, and people just kind of kept putting it off, and no one really wanted to do it. Ron knew that it had to get done. Wow. It was a thing. Brittany <coughs> and uh, all the GT. others. <laughs> Good job. Good job, Terry. <laughs> I had them all, and they all went away. Uh, that's weird. Oh, well. Uh, <laughs> but, geez, all those people would have not. Yeah, I mean, it would have happened eventually, but. He, he, he helped crazy. push it through, right? He was also instrumental in pushing Disney to expand their horizons, creating touchstone pictures. So they could, they could do PG movies away from the Disney brand, and it was okay. That was his brainchild. From what I could tell, That's smart. that was his brainchild. Which by the time touchstone pictures went live in 1984, it already had a movie finished and about to be released, the Tom Hanks vehicle, Splash. Aww. PG movie <laughs> showing boob. Yeah, which oh, also yeah. almost led to uh, that was what Splash Mountain was supposed to be based around. <laughs> that's right. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Can you imagine just as you as you're about to go for the drop, there's just this big titty that pops out. Oh jeez. <laughs> oh my gosh. Parents is gone. Yeah, we'll <laughs> no, got him. Now, if all of this crazy PG-rated stuff doesn't sound like something Walt would have wanted, right? We talk about that ad nauseum, kind of. This isn't what Walt would have wanted the right. park to be. That nobody knows. Walt wanted to make money and entertain people, and if it does those two things, probably more on the latter side than the former. It's mm-hmm. fine, right? <clears throat> but moving into PG was definitely something that was sketchy for a lot of people to really understand. So if you think like that, you would be wrong. Walt was a storyteller and for years prior to his death was getting frustrated at the reality that he could, he could not, oh, I can't even, I'm tripping over my own words. He got frustrated at the reality that he could only really produce G-rated films with the Disney name. This is from an interview with the LA Times back in 1980. Ron recalled a conversation he had with Walt. He says, I watched the frustration with Walt, the fact that he had cornered himself by being a G-rated company, while all of these other companies are making films dealing with sex and things like that. We had tunnel vision, and we could not break apart from that. One day, Walt called and said, I've got a film I'm running tonight. Why don't you come on over? So this is obviously in the 60s, right? So Diane and I, we went over there. The film was To Kill a Mockingbird. Whenever Kill a Mockingbird came out, I don't know, 64, 60, I can't remember. Uh, when it was over, Walt said, damn, I wish I could make a film like that. But he couldn't. Experimenting yeah. with racier themes after Walt's death was complicated by a fear of doing anything that might have displeased Walt Disney. Because of him, because of his influence, I second guess myself all the time. So it just you you can tell that Ron extraordinarily cares about the company and about the the the, the people and and what what his role means in the company. Yeah, and, and it's and interesting what it means to Walt and how to live up to that. And maybe him more so than anybody else because he was lived with him for 10 years or 12 years or whatever the math is, right? Like he he was family. Yeah, well that's what I was thinking is like he got hired I mean, it, you at least haven't touched on like what his actual skill set was. So it's almost like he... I think he was just smart. Like smart Walt saw something in him. I don't know. I, I, th- I think also what it is is he, he got put on, you know, old Yeller, right, as a second producer or whatever it was, a second assistant. And uh, he just kind of worked his way up through Hollywood in within the Disney arm, producing movies and just learning how to do stuff that's well all. And, and i guess that's what i'm kind of getting at is like it's it's interesting to s- to theorize i guess what his motivation was because mm. i think it would be logical and and totally okay if his motivation was to to just make his father-in-law proud oh you know i'm what I mean? sure oh yeah like even if that was his sole thing and he just did whatever he could to be good at all these things and like have these ideas and push them through. And yeah. it's just interesting. I, d- I just wonder, it's almost like chicken or the egg. Like, did he learn that from Walt or did he do that to, to have, uh, to have Walt look at him in a good way or something? Yeah. Or none of those. I don't know, but no one knows now. Can't talk to him. 
I feel like the Disney uh, the Disney Corporation is does nepotism correctly <laughs> because everyone that's part of the family yeah. really does well. You know, Diane Disney Miller did well. Roy E. Disney did well as well. You know, they just they really care about Walt's name and Walt's reputation, and they try to do everything they can to protect that while also figuring out ways to branch out and grow the corporation. You know, it's, it's true. Fantastic. I'm trying to find a Disney to marry him, but (laughs) (laughs) now you got like great, great grandkids out there or whatever. Right. Uh, Anyway, Miller says he considers Tron an artistic and commercial success. The film was a huge hit when it was released on home video. So it took a while. He also knows the film proved to be an important and inspirational to several filmmakers, including a young Disney animator again called John Lasseter. Who? <laughs> Grabby, Grabby McGraverson. Oh, uh, Lasseter has all has gone on record as saying that without Tron, there would be no Toy Story. Even telling the former Disney CEO that directly years later. Imagine that. So, and it, number one, this is one of the reasons I wanted to 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 talk about Ron and his legacy because I, I had no idea. And it's interesting how people in history can inspire other people to do stuff that is potentially even more important or just as important to a new set of people. And it's not just because Lasseter is good at storytelling because there's a, there's a foundation. I think exploring people's foundation to what motivates them to do the things they're doing, I find really fascinating. And, yeah. and just to, to read that quote, that's from, from Miller that Lasseter told him without Tron, I would not have made toy story. Totally. I would have, I would, because it got him fascinated in, uh, computer animation. Mm-hmm. Well, it sounds. And that's, like- I'm sorry, and that's why Miller wanted to make it. That was mm-hmm. part of the things he 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 realized that it was groundbreaking and it was pushing the envelope. He wanted to do something new, so that drive to do something new and creative, he signed off on Tron. Go ahead, please. Totally. No, I was just gonna and say then, what I- that Ron's <laughs> life. It's almost like a. It's like the butterfly effect or the do- like a domino effect. Like if his coach had not threatened usc right yeah none of like so many things that we take for granted now may not have happened yep it's crazy wild think about it he could have been a bruin who wants to be a bruin (laughs) wow (laughs) wow uh well i'll tell you who who who's really fed up with it john morrison was jim morrison was very (laughs) fed up with being a bruin (laughs) <laughs> it would have been funny if I remembered his name. Uh, Miller was there when the company entered the home video market, right? He was on the forefront of that. Uh, when it launched its cable TV network, of course, Disney Channel, made its initial four-way onto Broadway, and when it negotiated the deal for Tokyo Disneyland. Oh. So these are all kind of things that when he was present CEO, this is, this is what he was had his hands in, right? He also acquired a real estate company that helped Disney develop land near its Disney World complex in Lake oh. Buena Vista, Florida. The company has credited him, the company being the Walt Disney Company, as being a driving force behind Epcot Center. Oh. Nice. And brought the company closer to an agreement to open a Disney theme park in France, which of course happened a short time later in 1992. Again, so he really pushed the expansion of those parks. He helped. He helped out a lot too. Definitely wasn't all just him, but he was there, and he was. I I, I would be willing to bet that he could have killed any of those ideas. That's how mm-hmm. high up he was. So mm-hmm. it would seem that things were starting to develop for Ron. He started to come into his own, but <clears throat> there were incidents happening behind the scenes that Ron just couldn't avoid. Uh-oh. So when Miller became CEO of Disney in 1983, it gets a little weird here, and, and I may not have all of my like uh, definitions about, you know, uh, the weird stuff that was happening with junk bonds in the 80s, but I'm going to try. Uh, his predecessor, E. Carden Walker, stayed on as chairman of the executive committee and, quote, blocked nearly every innovation Miller and other executives proposed, including a proposal to raise the price of parking at Disneyland from a dollar. Mr. Walker also nixed Mr. Miller's attempt to hire someone called Michael Eisner, (laughs) who was then the CEO of Paramount Pictures for a top executive role at Disney. Hmm. So he had some backlash and I don't know what the, the issue was. If, if, if a uh, card as he was known, um, was forced out of his position or retired and just didn't like, and it's kind of what, uh, Tim Burton quote was talking about a little bit ago. There's a lot of old heads essentially 
fighting the change. And Ron Miller was definitely, I think, the face of that change. Yeah. And people just didn't like it. Carr didn't like it, and he was trying to just push back on everything. And there's even rumors uh, that part of the reason that these new PG Disney movies failed so miserably was that Walker refused to spend enough money to market them. I read like E.T. and, God, I think it was Raiders or something, got like $10 million in total for advertising. And Tron got like none. Hmm. They got no, almost no money. Not almost no money, but a, a drop in the bucket compared. They just weren't spending advertising dollars so nobody knew about them yeah or maybe the perception is they weren't very good so they're not going to they're not going to put out money on something that's not very good and maybe that's what card thought but uh it does seem like he was kind of trying to sabotage ron a little bit yeah Yeah. then in may of 1984 ron was at the center of a corporate crisis first disney agreed to fend off a hostile takeover attempt by the corporate raider saul steinberg With an extremely expensive buyback of Mr. Steinberg's stake in the company. That led to more than 20 disgruntled shareholders to sue the Disney company for wasting corporate assets. Mr. Miller defended the board's payment to Mr. Steinberg as a way to send him away and keep the company intact. So let's get into that just a a little bit because it's kind of confusing and not without some impact on what happens next to Ron, right? And I won't get too deep into it because the background is kind of complex and literally books have been written on just this <laughs> subject but I'll I'll try to do it justice. So, our good friend Roy, Walt's brother, was unhappy with the way the company was being run, so he planned a corporate takeover. He wanted to con- get control back. The way to do that is to buy a controlling share of the stock and seize power, but Roy didn't have that kind of cash, so he found a business partner in wealthy investment banker Michael Milken. Milken invented the term junk bonds like he was just kind of not really a very nice man he's a good businessman but he just ripped off a bunch of people what are junk don't ask me because okay. i don't know i didn't look into it because they weren't relevant here okay. but he made he's a million 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 millionaire okay. corporate takeover tried to take over a bunch of different corporations just makes a ton of money whatever okay. but he also kind of developed this uh, i don't know if he developed it but he he encouraged or at least helped the practice succeed in uh, something called green mail, and we'll get to that uh, in a in a second. So the two walked away. Uh, the two talked, uh, uh, Roy and Michael, uh, and Roy decided not to pursue the takeover. That's the story that I I could cobble together. However, Milken was still interested. He partnered with a man called Saul Steinberg. At one point, Reliance, which is uh, Steinberg's company, became Disney's largest stockholder. Steinberg then files an amendment 13D saying he intends to acquire 25% of the corporation of the 25% of the stock. I hope I'm getting all this right. It's I, I cobbled this from like six different articles. It, it's just, and I don't really, um, I believe we've really talked stupid. about it before as well. So yeah. I, I'm sure you're doing great. Uh, thanks. The CEO of Walt Disney was Walt Disney's son-in-law, Ron Miller. Of course, Saul Steinberg is a dear business partner with, uh, what, oh, with the Rothschilds, which, if look, if you want to get into Illuminati stuff right now, Rothschilds, oh, high-level yeah. Illuminati, but that's just whatever. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so Stahl, uh, Saul and Michael sent Disney a letter of intent to not only say that they had the money to buy enough shares to take over, but they were going to do it. Okay. So like a, hey, heads up. The only way around that is to buy all of the shares that Steinberg owned, nullifying his claim to the company. <clears throat> but Steinberg, of course, had a price. Ron paid $325 million oh. for uh, all of Steinberg's shares, including a $60 million premium, $60 million premium over the company's market value to reclaim the shares and protect the company. Wow. That's not going to sit well. Right. So those of you who are up on your 1980 corporate scams know the name Michael Milken, uh, of course. And <clears throat> what just happened is called green mail. It's like blackmail, but legal, which is why it's called green mail. <laughs> and it works funny. like this. <clears throat> Milken has the juice. He has the money. And he gives Steinberg a letter backing the funds that would be needed to purchase a controlling amount of Disney stock. So the Disney board thinks it can actually happen, whether or not that they meant to do it or d- doesn't matter. It's just basically they just signed off. Milken says, here's a letter uh, uh, that I have access to $40 million. And you can give that to the board. And then they look at the letter and go, oh, my God, Saul Steinberg has $40 million. Uh, he's going to do it. We have to act. Okay. They got freaked out by a letter. 
essentially yeah. is what I'm, I'm thinking. Uh, Miller pays Steinberg his money to go away, and then Milken receives a 40% cut of the money over the evaluation stock. So Milken, Milken got 40% of $60 million. Wow. And so this is Just le- legal? Is totally legal. Wow. Totally illegal. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, it was then. I don't know if it is now. Yeah. This is the no, 80s. Bro went to jail, dude. Yo, no, for sure. He definitely went yeah. to jail, but I don't know if it was from, from Green Mail. I think it was from a bunch of other... Anyway, look him up. He's he's a... Crazy. Dude. <clears throat> um, it's a practice Milken excelled in. Michael Milken's group made feints to take over a large number of corporations, including Walt Disney, Phillips Petroleum... Uh, and Avco, whoever that is. Saul Steinberg made what looked like the beginnings of a sincere, hostile takeover of Walt Disney through his company, Reliance. The stockholders of the targeted company are the real losers of Green Mail because the management of the corporation, in order to finance their protection, spends the stockholders' money, takes on new debt, and then deprives the stockholders of some profit-making potential of their shares. Mm -hmm. So everybody's mad, but... What would you rather have, right? You, the, the, yeah, the, you're, the you either company. lose control or you lose a ton of money. Within days of the buyout, the price of Disney stock plummeted $16 down to $49 a share. Oh, my gosh. At $77 a share, including expenses of Mr. Steinberg's 11% stake in the company. So they paid $77 a share to Steinberg plus expenses. And I think the stock was not, it was like 57 or uh, whatever yeah. the math is. I don't know. But he had 11% stock. You, you got to get all that back. So anyway, during this, Roy, who of course held a major part of company stock, played dumb, claiming he had no part in the takeover attempt. Soon after the buy-off, however, Steinberg saw his shares in Disney double. So somehow mm. after the buyout, Steinberg got double the amount of shares he had before apparently that's uh, there's some that sounds sketchy. there's some contention of the numbers uh, but that's what i read he got more stock than he had before and 11 days after ron fended off the buyout roy rejoined the board of steinberg's company reliance group holdings so roy was on the board mm-hmm. roy left the board steinberg made the made the go to take over the disney company that got that failed. He got bought out, and then Roy rejoined. The, but he claimed he had no. This sounds very Trump. Yeah, <laughs> Trumpy. Uh, it, it, and this like, is really kind of a, a thing with Roy too. I mean, he did this with Eisner. He tried to get Eisner out also in the early two thousands. Yeah. I think so. He just he. I don't know. I don't know what his deal was. Well, but it definitely was, sounds like he orchestrated. Uh, at, I mean, at least getting uh, getting Milken and Steinberg together to then you guys do this and I can come back and whatever. Yeah. <clears throat> so. Well, and he was always the numbers guy. He didn't care how the castle looked. He just wanted to do it as cheap as possible. Yeah. So in that respect, I, c- I could see it being a possibility. I guess I hope not because it kind of... Uh, tarnishes the, uh, the, <laughs> the sparkle a little yeah. but also if, if Roy even had any sparkle I don't know sometimes you have to I think as a Disney fan um, especially as they're growing and as we're getting angry and they're raising prices it's it is kind of nice to be reminded that they are a business and they've been a business the whole time mm-hmm. this isn't the first time that they've um, upset people <laughs> yeah and uh, so I guess that is the silver lining Sure. <laughs> was Go it, ahead. Was it, was it Roy that was trying to oust him, or was it Roy E. Disney? Was it Roy's son? Oh, I think that might have been it. I think that I was think probably it. might have been his son oh, at that point, I because Roy would have right. been like 158. <laughs> you're right. You're right. You're right. I was, yes, uh, that's correct. Man. He'd be the oh, that guy's keep, just a jerk. Be the crypt keeper, yeah. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> uh, <clears throat> shortly after the buyout, the company bowed to pressure exerted by a shareholder group led by Erwin L. Jacobs, who's a Minneapolis businessman, that owned 6.9% of Disney stock. And they canceled a $330 million purchase of Gibson greeting cards days before its scheduled completion. So he had he had this buyout happen, then they were going to buy this greeting card company, and then a shareholder group said, no, we don't want you to do it. So then he had to back out, and Ron, I can imagine, is going, I don't really know what to do now. I don't. Everyone's mad at me, no matter what happens. Hmm. So these events tar, uh, 
Tard. Disney. T- tared? Tardish. Tardish. No, T A R E D. I don't know where I was. Starred? Oh. I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> um, but they gave Disney's management an image of weakness, and some Wall Street analysts complained that the company's credibility had been seriously damaged. And especially in the 80s, man, stock market, huge thing. I mean, not that it's not now, but, you know, back then that was a big, it was way, I think, way more important than it is now, I guess, or the mm-hmm. perception of that. Yeah. People got more angry about it. I don't know. Well, watch it, watch Trading Places. You'll understand. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, even as the board was evaluating uh, Mr. Miller's performance in late August of 1984, he was trumpeting the synergy he envisioned for its costliest animated film ever, The Black Cauldron, marketing it as a theatrical release, a video cassette, a featured Disney Channel movie, and a theme park ride. So, oh. so the board's talking about, like, what kind of job is Ron actually doing? And he's going, <laughs> bro, don't worry about it. Check this out. We're going to make this a ride. So we're the kind of doing now what Ron was thinking about in the 80s. Everything's yeah. synergistic. Let's make everything this thing, right? But they had big plans for the Black Cauldron. It flopped. Well, of course. <laughs> Tanked. And part of that, they think, is because Star Wars. Mm. Well, they had their <clears throat> chance. Mr. Miller did not have much more time to contemplate Disney's future because in early September, the company's board asked him to resign. This is why I love Ron right here. Before the board members voted, he looked at them and angrily asked, don't you have something to say to me? Aren't you men? Oh, Oh, snap. I've given my life to this company. I have never worked anywhere else. I think I've taken great strides in leading it as far as it's come. I feel like this is a betrayal. And he bounced. Wow. He left. And of course, he was, oddly enough, replaced by Michael Eisner, who Oof. Disney tried to recruit earlier to join the board. Well, and Ron so tried weird. to recruit him, right? Is that, is that what Ron, you said? That's what I, I yeah, Ron, sometimes yeah. in my head, I confuse Roy and Ron. You said, you said Disney. So that's why I got confused. But yeah, but oh, Ron tried remember. to recruit him earlier, and then he ended up stealing his job. Yeah. Well, he ended up replacing him. I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. I guess yeah. he didn't steal his job, but yeah. geez. So not surprisingly, that same year, Diane and Ron separated for several months, oh. presumably over tensions with the family from Roy having played such a role in Ron's ousting, but they didn't really talk about it. Nobody really knows. Awkward. So <clears throat> I, I, there's some magazine, I forget what it was. It was online where they ask... Ron, uh, they were interviewing him in the 80s and, and they asked him a bunch of like, you know, questions like what was your biggest challenge or whatever. Right. And uh, it's all just standard stuff. Uh, but they go, uh, if you had a magic wand, you would whatever. And he goes, if I had a magic wand. OK, <clears throat> I should I should clarify. Diane died in like 2009, I think is what it was. OK, mm-hmm. okay so this is after this. Right. He goes, if I had a magic wand, I would have my wife next to me. Five years of living alone. It's tough. I, I know. I meant to move that down uh, so it's a little out of place, but it was still really nice. Yeah. And it kind of goes along with, that's another reason why I really like Ron. He seems like just kind of a nice, just down to earth, normal dude. Yeah. I don't know. So after they left, um, Ron and Diane moved to Napa. They had a, a, a winery up there, hmm. Silverado. Winery. Really? So, yep. Oh, that's where I'm. Go- I'm staying there. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, nice. That's where I'm staying in the March. Oh well, it, it's uh, owned by uh, the Millers. I did not well, know that. Not anymore, I guess. But their children, I imagine. Uh, but anyway, they they moved up there, and you know they were refurbishing a bunch of vineyards and whatever. And then, of course, Diane launched the Walt Disney Family Museum. So, uh, Ron served on the board of directors. At, at the uh, museum since its opening in 2009 and became president in November of 2013. Um, did I, wow, did I skip a bunch of, no, I didn't. Okay. <clears throat> um, that's all boring stuff. Okay. Uh, Diane died in 2013, blah, blah, blah. The museum opened in 2009. <clears throat> so if you're in the magic kingdom, which is Disney world, for those of you who are like me and can't keep the two uh, straight, you can find actually two windows dedicated to Ron, though I can only find the location of one, which is very weird. So you are would, you sure there's two? Yeah. yeah, I'm very positive there's two. I found two photos, and there's references to two, but anywhere I look for the locations of the windows, there's there's no guy. I mean, there's a book. I'm not going to buy a book. Someone should have them on a friggin' website. 
here's this is a window this person bam here's where it is that's why i try to push whenever we do our windows where is it yeah where is it located interesting so anyway i know one is above the main street bakery and it says the original dick nunes gym turkish baths massage parlor 24-hour service supervisor dick nunes night manager ron miller Masur o ferrante and just so you know who these people are, uh, Dick Nunes began his Disney career in the summer of 55 at Disneyland as an assistant to uh, someone called Van France in orient- orient- tr- orientation training. God bless. He worked <laughs> up through the ranks as area supervisor, supervisor of the mailroom and steno pool, director of Disneyland operations in 1961, and vice president of Disneyland operations in 1968. In 1972, he became executive vice president of both Disneyland and Disney World, and president in 1980. He was a member of the Disney Board of Directors from 81 to 99, and was named chairman of Walt Disney Attractions in 1991. Orlando Ferrante, that was Massieu O. Ferrante, was vice president of Mapo for WED WDI and oversaw ride and show production and installation for WDW, Tokyo Disneyland, and Euro Disneyland. And the other uh, window is uh, Ron and Diane Miller, and it has like the name of their kids, and it's the, the name of their ranch in Wyoming or something like that. So Okay. And that's the uh, the life and times of Ron Miller. Wow. Right. Good job. That's a... Um, Kid did a lot, Crazy. Man. Right? That's really interesting. I do think we should do more of these and maybe not always just when they pass away because it's really cool. I want to talk about Card. I think E. Card Walker or whatever his name was. Yeah. That dude did a lot also. Like he he was very, uh, very much involved in Disney World and planning that whole thing. And he sounded like a really interesting dude. There's a lot of there's a lot of people we could we could talk about like that. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, How you doing, Terrence? You all right? Yeah, I'm good. All right. This is uh, it's a long one. I'm gonna do a little bit of news, uh, and then we're gonna go. My my voice is already like I'm pushing right now. So we're not gonna do as much news as I wanted, but uh, hang on. Nope, I don't want to do that right now. Of course, I have the secret show to do. Exactly. I have a bunch of reading to do. The Illuminati, baby. Let's go. I know. I, 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 I'm I, surprised you wanted to do two shows that, uh, like you did. You haven't even done like your own show in a really long time either. I know. Except for like interviews, but you haven't done like a, a show <coughs> where you have to do research and stuff. How'd I do? You did great. It was all right? Yeah. Terrence, well, on a scale from, uh, from uh, I don't know, watermelon and biscuit churro. To, I'm, I'm trying to think of like the weird like flavors of churros they have now, like uh, like kale and <laughs> on a scale from kale and potato chip churros to regular churros. How did I do? That was a solid like red velvet cake churro. <laughs> wow. Nice. That's a good thing. Uh, I was going to say, the problem with this scale is that I don't know. I don't. <laughs> right. th- it's like getting a four star r- like rating on something. It's like it's still not good enough. <laughs> Just oh, it was actually enough. very good. I was quite impressed. All right. Well, thank you. You're welcome. March in the past, present, and future with all the news that's fit to cover. It's the Ears Up Disney News. All right. A little bit of Disney news here. Fellas, and then we're going to take off. I don't know if you guys have seen uh, or heard about this or whatever, but the trailer for Aladdin came out recently. Did anybody watch it in this room? Uh, no, but I. Yeah. Terrence, did you watch it? Terrence, we lo- How did we lose Terrence? All right, well we lost Terrence. Oh. That's too bad. Uh, no, <laughs> yeah. I have not seen it, and um, but I I saw a screenshot of. Uh, Will Smith. Oh yeah. In blueface, and <laughs> I did not like it. Oh, there you are, Terrence. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was really weird. It was very. Did you watch the trailer for Aladdin, Terrence? Yeah, I shook my head the whole time, man. <laughs> that looks horrible. Oh. Disney has unveiled their latest trailer for Guy Ritchie's Aladdin, offering the world a first look at Will Smith's blue genie, which everyone was really excited about. He was going to be blue, and that's cool. You know, throwback to the movie. Unfortunately, the internet has not reacted favorably with tweets being quick to mock the bizarre CGI genie. On Twitter, one user wrote, either this is a super clever marketing troll by Disney (laughs) and this isn't what the genie will actually look like for Aladdin or 
I don't know, man. I just can't believe this is possibly the real thing. I just can't. <laughs> Another person added, the Will Smith genie feels like a spoiler for Bird Box because I finally understand <laughs> what image would make them so fascinated but also wanted to kill themselves. Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, many people posted side-by-side -side photos of Smith's genie and David Cross's arrested development character Tobias <laughs> Funke in blue man makeup. Yes. Richie previously <laughs> said of the floating version of Smith's character, I wanted a muscular 1970s dad. I, I don't know what that means. What? Uh, uh, what does it even mean? He was big enough to feel like a force, not so muscular that he looked like he was counting his calories, but formidable enough to look like you knew when he was in the room. Okay. I, <laughs> what? They, they thought too much about this. They really did. And my problem with it was whenever you watched him... Um, like speak because it's only like a, a, a I don't know thirty seconds or whatever. Um, his mouth didn't really have a full range of movement, right? And yeah, it, it seemed very clunky and, and weird. And it's like this is not going to be good. This is not yeah. this is not going to be good. But what do I know, man? Mm. I'm not. Uh, what am I, Ron Miller? <laughs> am I Ron Miller in this piece? No. This next story is going to make you upset. Uh, if you love Nightmare Before Christmas. Oh. Don't get too mad. It's a rumor. But uh, there's a report online that was initially published uh, on some other stupid website that they're talking very, very early on about doing a live-action remake of The Nightmare Before Christmas. Why and how? Exactly. That's exactly both of those things. I don't understand, um, but that's that's the that's the rumor happening right now. Uh, they're saying that considered both a Christmas and a Halloween film, the Nightmare for Christmas raked in seventy five billion dollars worldwide. Billion with a bill. That's what this that's what this dumb site says. I can't believe uh, that seems crazy. But maybe with all the merch and all the other stuff. Excuse me, I, I I don't know, man. But uh, can you imagine? Can you can you imagine a remake, a live action remake? How dare how dare they, Terrence? I'm actually offended. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And they also need to stop calling movies that use CGI <laughs> as live action. Yeah, live action. They are talking about potentially doing either a sequel or just like a straight up reboot. And it's like, what? Why are we? Why are we doing this? I don't understand. Uh, you know, I'm already. Uh, I don't know. I'm already ready for the Aladdin reboot. Or, you know, the next sp Spider-Man reboot. It's just. It's just. It's annoying. It bothers me. It bothers me a lot. Here's what doesn't bother me. Disney inks a deal with Hulu to make four animated Marvel superhero series, including everyone's favorite horny duck, Howard the Duck. Nice. I'm on board with that. I really enjoy Howard the Duck. I think it's a great movie. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I don't know. That's about it. I can talk about m more about it, but uh, I don't really want to. Anyway, can you imagine Howard the Duck live? <laughs> that <laughs> animated on Hulu which I don't have a subscription to but I would definitely borrow somebody's right that actually sounds pretty amazing I'm not going to lie <laughs> man I read that uh, I think it was Netflix or maybe it was like just some some um, conference some software thing where someone came up with a script to detect if somebody if you had given out your password to like Netflix or something like that which is Ooh, against their terms of service. Yeah, I hope yeah, they I, never come up with that. I know. You know what I'm saying? Speaking yeah. of stuff that uh, I think I'm glad that they never came up. No, I don't know. Uh, Disney's Pirates of the Caribbean reboot is now uncertain as the writers jump ship. And the writers I, were the two Deadpool dudes. And so remember, this was the uh, potentially about the redhead. This was that movie. Oh, okay, okay. That makes sense now. Okay. Yeah. Well, good. <laughs> <laughs> that has made 4.5 billion worldwide box office and 2.5 billion more in merchandise since 2003. So Jeez. maybe 75 billion cuz I mean, uh, Nightmare had been out it's like 25 years old I think now or something like that. So mm -hmm. it's uh, yeah, it's doable. That's for sure. 
But anyway, that's I mean, there's really no nothing to this stupid article. But uh, the guys who write, wrote Deadpool were talking about it, and then they left, and it was gonna you know have the uh, the redhead from Pirates that was redone now. I'm I'm hoping that this just stays quiet and they don't do it. They don't need to do it, but of course they're going to, and everyone's going to go see it because there's more people in the world now, and so they're just going to go see it because it's the same reason you slow it down on the freeway for the fender bender. You just want to see how much damage was done. <laughs> right? Here's an interesting article. Old, there's an old Florida law that apparently says Disney can build a nuclear power plant. Huh? <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, apparently, it was an example of the resort's political leverage it had in creating the Magic Kingdom in 1971. Mm-hmm. So now the question is, oh, here's the law. The 1967 state law that established Disney's quasi-government is overreaching since oversight on whether to build a nuclear power plant now falls in the... No, that's not. that's not even the quote I meant to read. Um, Disney wanted protection from government regulation. They knew that Florida and the local community wanted them to come and build their new park. They knew they had political leverage to get what they wanted. The state created Disney's private government and then gave it the power to build roads and drains, levy taxes, issue bonds, blah, blah, blah. It also allowed Disney to look to the future for other items it could need someday, such as a nuclear power plant and an airport. Huh. And okay. so the the problem is that di- there's look there's no way Disneyland or Disney World excuse me don't everyone panic is going to build a nuclear power plant uh, can you imagine come glow in the dark children and see <laughs> the wonders of the atom splitting over your skin as it melts your eye. like it, anyway um but now there's a a few government people in Florida who are they actively want to change that law Like, they want to spend the time and effort to just make sure that Disney doesn't build a power plant. Which would never, ever happen. Uh, Yeah, exactly. Oh, (laughs) jeez. I don't know, man. Just the whole thing is just so funny, dude. This might be our last one. We'll see. Depends on when Tarrant comes back in the room. Uh, Walt Disney Archives founder Dave Smith passed away recently at 98. Excuse me. Jesus. 78. Homie was 78 years old. And uh, so Tarrant has been talking with with Dave uh, a couple months ago, I think, uh, recently, just trying to get him on the show. We've been trying to book him for a couple of years now, actually. And uh, it was kind of sad. He was like, I would really love to, but I can't really do anything right now. I'm not really feeling well. I'm kind of under the weather. Right. Um, and so, unfortunately, he passed away, which is uh, it's too bad. He was Disney's chief archivist from 1970 to 2010. He was named a Disney legend in 2007 and served as a consultant to the company after his retirement. This is a quote from Bob Iger. He says he was the unsung hero of Disney's history who, as our very first archivist, spent 40 years uh, rescuing countless documents and artifacts from obscurity, investing endless hours restoring and preserving these priceless pieces of our legacy and putting them in context to tell our story. Dave was a true Disney legend, and we are indebted to him for building such an enduring, tangible connection to our past that continues to inspire our future. He was hired in 1970 by Walt Disney's brother Roy O. Disney. His first job was to catalog every item in Walt Disney's executive suite at the Burbank Studio, a space that had been left untouched after Walt Disney's death in 1966. So for four years, the office just, don't touch it. Is it? Jeez. <laughs> Smith's work allowed the company to recreate Walt's office for an installation build in 2015 to help inspire Disney's contemporary workforce. Weird. Uh, Smith was a prolific author, pr- prolific barfer, <laughs> of books about Walt Disney Company, including the company's official encyclopedia, Disney A to Z. Other titles include Disney, The First Hundred Years, The Quotable Walt Disney, Disney A Trivia from the Vault, and four volumes of the Ultimate Disney, tr- Disney Trivia Books. Raised in Pasadena, Smith earned a BA in history and a master's in library science. So Dewey Decimal That's System a- knows it. Nice. Anyway, he also interned at the Library of Congress. It's kind of cool. Wow. That- that is kind of cool. Yeah. I like it. I mean, not that 
he died because it's really sad, but I mean, he was the first arc. I mean, so a company that's been around since what the 30s, 20s, 30s, whenever it was to 1970. That's a lot of history to, to dig up and go through. I'm kind of surprised that no one really thought about doing that before, or at least acted on it. Right. I completely agree. Yeah. Uh, this might be the last one. And again, it's another job thing. Apparently Disney's hiring right now uh, for a pyrotechnician. It's a seasonal position, but I thought it was really fun. I kind of want to read about it because who know? I had no idea what, what it takes to be someone who lights off fireworks for a living. Like I had no idea. Uh, the responsibilities are loading pyrotechnic devices, firing pyrotechnic devices, non-theatrical, it says, strike pyro and sets, build pyro fixtures as needed, rehab, driving mechanized transportation, receiving an inventory, yada, 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 basic qualifications. Must currently hold a basic commercial pyrotechnical license from the California State Fire Marshal. <laughs> yeah, I, that's a thing. Apparently, may be in the process of pursuing a California pyrotechnic operator theatrical trainee license. I mean, I guess it makes, first of all, if you, if you need to have any job in California, get ready to pay out fees and to have a license for it. That's just a fact. But the fact that there's a pyrotechnic operator theatrical trainee license is pretty cool. I don't know why. Um, ability to use common hand tools and handheld power tools. <laughs> uh, look, I can I can design uh, fireworks, dude. But uh, what's the what's the? It, it's like half of a of a, a plus sign screwdriver. What's that called? I don't know. I can't use that. I don't know what that means. I just imagine someone that's from uh, Tropic Thunder, the dude that had the claws for hands. He's like, man, I've been working with fireworks forever. I'm just not very good at it. So. <laughs> Ability to use common pyrotechnic firing systems, including but not limited to pyro digital systems, basic electrical knowledge, basic mathematical skills, ability to connect modules, firing strips, and to use cables. What really got me was basic mathematical skills. Like, how basic are we talking about? I feel like when you're launching fireworks, it's not all that basic. I feel like there's... Yeah, you got to know like exact degrees. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. I feel like there's... Uh... There's a little bit more going on than, well, if I have four pounds of this and two pounds of this, how many pounds do I have? <laughs> um, here's one for you, Terrence. This is the last one, and then we'll leave. Now Terrence back in the room. She's going to get one Disney hit in, and then we're going to get out of here. Uh, will Disney ever build a Black Panther Wakanda theme park land? No. Terrence. Terrence. Lost you. Hi. <laughs> Can you hear me? I just heard Black Panther. That's all I heard. <laughs> uh, well, this uh, article is asking if Disney will ever build a Wakanda. Oh. And now it's like locked me out, so I can't, oh. I can't read it. But uh, P and it's it's from the Mercury News, which is semi local paper, and they're basically like, well, it's it's pretty much begging for it, just like Harry Potter Land. I'm like, ah, no, nah, dude, it's not the same. It's and really Wakanda not sounds cool. Wakanda the only sounds cool thing about cool. Wakanda is going into it. What do you mean? So, um, okay, I'm sorry. I keep losing you. So with Wakanda, it looks like it's um, like the African plains, and then yeah. you go through a hologram, and then you go into the city. But then when you get into the city, it looks like it's like a Middle Eastern um, – trading depot like you're walking through you know what i mean it's like right, it's, right, it right. looks like like aladdin almost like that's not yeah i'm cool with that uh, yeah you know what i agree and honestly it, it i think interventions would be great for wakanda because i think they they have those you know almost tony stark-esque kind of capabilities to build all the the cool tech but for the most part it just looks like futuristic buildings like there wasn't to me there wasn't a whole lot to vibe off of like Harry Potter, like mm -hmm. Diagon Alley and stuff. There, there's a whole lot of stuff there. But Wakanda, there really, there really wasn't. Right, I completely agree. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, I think we're gonna get out of here, Terrence. Okay. We're done. Okay. You want to hang on for? I mean, I'll call you back before we start the secret show. Okay. Okay. Is that cool? Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, hey, meet yourself. I'm gonna play the outro, and then, uh, and then we're gone. Oops. Here we go. Hold on. I can do that. 
All right, everybody. Again, thanks to GetawayToday.com for sponsoring today's episode. Whether you're traveling to Disneyland, Disney World, or beyond, head over to GetawayToday.com slash ears up. And don't forget to ask for the 21st Amendment beers wherever you find good craft beer like DCA. If you are a member of Patreon and you're listening live, give us about half an hour. We'll be back with our brand new secret show called The Pyramid, The Eye, The Ears. It's going to be a good time. For everybody else, until next time, we'll see you in the parks.